This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Last lane at one time or another on the matrix of cement thoroughfares that crisscross Los Angeles and environs, and, usually, nobody pays much attention until it involves murder. During the 1970s and early 1980s, more than a hundred young hitchhikers caught rides on the streets and freeways of Southern California and didn't live to tell about it. Some of them became nameless bodies, forever to be known as John Doe 16 or 229. Some have names but no bodies, their human remains never having been found. Some became headless torsos or disembodied heads, or worse, the living cadavers of amateur sadosurgeons who used liquor as anesthesia, fishing knives as scalpels, and ice picks for probes. Sometimes their body parts were stuffed in black plastic trash bags and left in the desert to rot. Sometimes they were tossed in restaurant garbage bins. Most of the time, they were simply pitched from a moving car or van like empty Coke cans or used hamburger wrappers. Law enforcement has always known that there are predators who troll the freeway on ramps and beach highways for hitchhikers. The hunters range in perversity from harmless to heinous. Occasionally, they're just looking for money. Usually, they are interested in quick, impersonal sex. And, sometimes, they want more. The term serial killer came into vogue in the early 80s used by police to describe the peculiarly modern type of American demon who selects his victims like ripe tomatoes in a grocery store. Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Juan Corona were all members of the fraternity. Unlike mass murderers who go into a frenzied killing spree and are spent, a serial murderer devours, savors, and digests each victim before reaching out to pluck up another. The victims themselves are usually society's helpless or disenfranchised. Children, derelicts, and hookers are the easiest targets because they are vulnerable and can't fight back. Young hitchhikers who are rootless, often broke and alone, are hard to trace back to hearth and home. They too have little in the way of support from the larger society. Only when serial murders begin violating the sanctity of the home or the family, as in the case of Richard Ramirez, the so-called Night Stalker of Los Angeles, who broke into suburban homes in the summer of 1985, are they tracked down and caught by an outraged society. If they are careful and fortunate and pick their prey well, there is no outrage. No alarm set off by hysterical parents a confounded constabulary, or an infuriated press. The killers can practice their craft with virtual impunity, learning from their mistakes and developing a style that only they and their victims can appreciate, like the inevitable hypnotic dance of death that unfolds between cat and mouse, shark and fish, but rarely between human and human. The first murder would be like a good meal, Stanford University psychology professor David Rosenhan once told me, a truly memorable meal, the kind that you can shut your eyes and remember for years afterwards. All the other murders stem from that first one, like you or me trying to recapture that perfect dinner we experienced once in a little Parisian cafe or whatever. The taste, the smell, the moment. But we never quite recapture it. But knowing how it happens doesn't explain why it happens. Serial killers are not crazy in the commonly accepted sense of the term. Most of the time, they are perfectly sane, abnormally normal, as prosecutor Brian Brown once described a young computer consultant named Randy Kraft, who was believed to have picked up hitchhikers along Southern California's freeways and spirited them away into the night never to return. After years of study and experimentation, behavioral scientists like Rosenham can explain psychotic disorders such as manic depression, 
paranoia, or schizophrenia. But the sociopathic personalities that put on one face for family and...